Right, uh, good morning from the Asia Pacific. Welcome to the show. Welcome to Bloomberg Market China Open. I'm David Ingles here with Yvonne Mann yep. with some breaking news. Yep, RBNZ decision just dropping in the last few seconds here, and it is a hold when it comes to central bank policy there and that cash rate at 5.5%. So this was seen by most economists there. I think it was only two ANZ and TD Securities that was actually forecasting a hike. But there you go. You are seeing the Kiwi drop like a rock here this morning. I've, there was a lot of anticipation leading up to this. Even, you know, we're talking about implied vol yeah. around the heat was just nuts, even a day before. Yeah, decision. we were at seven month high on the overnight rate. And, you know, they got it right, actually. So we're dropping by, we're weaker by half of 1%. Another red headline is crossing the terminal Ooh. right now. Less hawkish, hence the move in the Kiwi. Forecasts on the average uh, official cash rate as you look through the mid of next year does indicate a smaller probability of a rate hike this year so far. Uh, that stood out so far. What else are you seeing? There's also the high headline CPI limits the ability to tolerate surprises. So that certainly is some dovish language coming through from Adrian Orr here this morning and, of course, the boards. We'll, we'll continue to watch that. There's a press briefing happening in the next uh, hour or so, so, which we'll count you down to as well. But sustained capacity decline needed to hit that inflation target. Capacity constraints in labor market have also eased right now. Show potential, forecast show potential rate cuts in the first half of 2025. Okay, yeah, so it does indicate, just to sum things up, based on the numbers coming through, it does seem uh, we are at peak as far as the rates are concerned. The easing cycle, based on the forecast show, that easing cycle begins uh, early of next year. Kiwi dollar on offer even further. Session lows right now, six-tenths uh, of 1%. And for our Bloomberg clients... Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Turn to your, your, your Bloomberg Tea Live Go. I mean, that's where all you get commentary analysis from our expert editors as well. So that's starting off and firing up here right now. And keep in mind, tomorrow we're speaking to the governor himself. The mm -hmm. RBNZ governor, Adrian Orr, is going to be joining us to go over that decision. And, of course, what comes next, 8.15 a.m. Hong Kong time on Thursday, 1.15 p.m. in Wellington. Yeah, there we go. In particular, we're also asking about what he thinks about China because the statement coming out, and as you look at futures in Singapore right now, the outlook for China, according to the RBNZ, remains particularly weak against your historical norm. If the futures coming online, we're now flat over in Singapore, S&P futures, and broadly speaking, the equity complex, cautious, caution, uh, is the mood out there, uh, half of 1% to the downside. couple of markets uh, coming online within these markets. We're looking at a couple of stocks. Case in point, you have Singapore. Within that, you have OCBC reporting earnings uh, a couple of hours back. There we go on your screens. We're down 1.7% in the opening minutes on OCBC. Malaysia, just to mention that, in the ring at bottom of your screens. Commentary, speaking of central banks, coming out of the Bank Negara, yesterday talking about how maybe the currency is slightly trading slightly uh, on the weaker side of things. Speaking of central banks and currency markets, flip the boards please if we can. Uh, dollar yen, dollar China, the euro, and I believe we have the Aussie in there uh, as well. 150.45 against uh, is, is where we are as far as dollar yen is concerned. Bond markets are doing this. Uh, you have the twos at the 30 year and China's been in focus. We're up now seven straight days on your CGBs. 250 is the level. We're looking at your twos and the tens. Now you look at swaps. We've gone from nearly seven rate cuts price to now bottom of your screens. Just three cuts price for 2024. Very quickly, commodity markets end. 60,000 is on next level to watch on Bitcoin. We're now 3,000 bucks away from that level. Some upside we're seeing right now in the early goings in the Asia Pacific. Yep. Maybe we'll get there and <laughs> we'll see yeah. today. Uh, getting to 54,000 was one thing, and now we're at 57. Uh, let's take a look when it comes to the HSCI, though. So we, we marked this on the CSI 300 just a few sessions ago. Yeah. But when it comes to the H shares, uh, we officially erased the 2024 losses that we've seen so far. Just goes to show that, you know, we are seeing even the offshore market kind of play in with this whole sort of recovery in, in this market. Hang Seng Index coming up next, too. Yeah, very close to that. We could get there today, right? Let's bring yeah. in Chris Z with us here on set, head of Asia Equity Advisory at BNP Paribas Wealth Management. Good morning. It's nice to see you. Thanks for having me, and good morning to you both. We were just talking about the rally in, obviously, Hong Kong markets, China as well. How much room 
do you think this rally has to go? Because we've seen this before, and typically this is when the movie ends, 16, 15, 16 percent in. Sure. So we remain constructive in the Hong Kong China markets mm. because we think uh, the valuation definitely is very uh, appealing mm. and very attractive. And speaking of catalyst, there's ample. Uh, leading up to um, the two sessions next week, there's expectations uh, because two sessions is usually when the China's leadership they unveil the annual GDP target. And mm. for this, our house view is four and a half percent growth. And then uh, looking also ahead uh, for this uh, two sessions, there may be some expectations. There are some special packages may be also introduced. Mm. So hopefully, you know, uh, packages such as uh, special uh, debts may be targeted into spe uh, specific areas like uh, the infrastructure mm. and hopefully, more hopefully, on, on a property <laughs> sector. Oh. Okay. Uh, yeah, I'm just wondering. How important is it for them to maintain that growth target of 5%? What, what does that mean for the market in, in some ways, right? And if you're thinking 4.5% for, for next year, are you expecting that growth target to be cut? No, not necessarily. On the country, we, we are quite firm on the 4.5% uh, because historically, China has a very good track record of beating you know, their own uh, guidances, and then last year including. So this year, we, we are confident about the 45 and, and let's see what uh, they announce next week uh, at the two sessions. Right. Which brings to mind what the economy needs is what it's not what the market's asking for, right? So four and a half percent, again to Yvonne's point, that doesn't seem to scream stimulus is coming and market is looking yeah. for stimulus. Uh, on the country, we believe you know China is quite proactive in uh, announcing and, and, and introducing the stimulus, including right. you know the series of uh, triple R cuts. Okay. They also cut interest rates, including LPRs, a few times. Right. And then the body language, uh, you know, is such that there may be more to come. Right. And then also they uh, they cut the mortgage uh, rates requirements as well as the, yeah the mortgage uh, requirements for not just the first homes but also mm. the second and third homes. So these are you know strong signals being sent to the market. So you may be correct. Uh, the market is not rewarding uh, these stimuluses, mm. uh, but then it takes time for these uh, stimulus to filter through mm. to the uh, real economy. Mm. So that's our take. Okay. Um, is there a preference on on where you lean to? I, we have UBS's Eva Lee coming up later on. She says you know. Hong Kong could actually be that place, right? Because for one thing, you can benefit from the Fed easing uh, or the cutting cycle, and also that dividend play that you're seeing really play out in the Hong Kong market. Is that, is that a good proxy? to use for the China, around, China turnaround story? For the Hong Kong China market, uh, for sector wise, we, we are highly constructive on a couple sectors, the uh, consumer and also including the tourism. Mm. Uh, so besides those, we are also constructive on the dividend yield play, mm. which includes the tele telecom sector and also the banks. Uh, anything you're cautious on? What, what are you not going to touch? Well, uh, I wouldn't quite say that, but then uh, oh, those, are the, I'm sorry. those okay. are the, okay, well, those are the okay. areas that yeah. we, we, we like a bit more. Yeah. Okay, then others. Okay. Uh, anything on property? Uh, property, we, yeah, we, 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 we await for those uh, packages okay. hopefully to come. Okay. Yeah. Uh, the market that you do like still is, is Japan. Um, yes. Just given, Exciting. I mean, we already hit records. Yeah. Uh, what, what else is there to chase? In this very point. exciting that we have seen, very amazing in the past uh, 18 months indeed. So what triggered is basically a couple of factors, right? Uh, ratification of the decade-long uh, cross-shareholding structure, and also the uh, high expectation of uh, Bank of Japan to finally leave the uh, negative interest rates territory. Mm. This is a huge, huge move. So uh, that benefits multiple sectors. And then, uh, you know, Japan just wrapped up basically the earnings season for the last quarter, mm. and then not just the uh, electronics guys, not just the exporters, but then multiple uh, uh, arrays of sectors, including property, banks, REITs, they all came out to beat, to beat pretty handsomely. So these are the multiple drivers that are still you know, in front of us, yeah. um, so we, 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 we remain constructive on the overall Japanese markets. Interesting, because the market's actually cheaper now than it was a few weeks ago, despite the price, to your point on earnings. Uh, give us something more granular in Japan. Do I buy the Do I buy the index? What kind of exposure does one want in Japan at this point in time? Well, you, you hit the nail right on. Um, you know, it's on a valuation wise, it, it is cheaper because the E keeps on rising. Mm. So on a PE, it's lower. So that's a good reason to buy. Mm. Uh, now for sectors, uh, given the fact that it's high, ex highly expected, the uh, rates will will, will leave uh, the negative territory. We are highly positive on the banks, mm. and then also um, on on the REITs. 
as well as some selective property names. So uh, these are more interest rate sensitive, quote unquote, uh, sectors. Um, other areas that we are quite constructive upon would be some um, selective uh, electronic exporters. So including some video games companies, uh, game yeah. developers. I think I know what you're talking so about, those, going into names. So those uh, would be quite interesting. The prospect of the BOJ doing something because the underlying story is good. That strengthens the yen. Is that a risk or an opportunity? And you have to hedge it. Hmm. Well, we, we believe there's, you know, always opportunities. And then, you know, Japanese corporates, if, uh, for the past decades, they've been highly prepared and highly trained uh, to hedge, you know, these uh, yen movements. So uh, we, we believe it's uh, more opportunities for uh, investors overall. Yeah, what's been driving Japan is, is the corporate governance stuff, with you, with which you mentioned about AI certainly has been driving that trade in, in yeah. some ways. I, I have to talk about the broader AI story. Um, you know, how, how do you look at AI in Asia in particular? I mean, do you think the tech supply chain is, is well-placed to ride this AI wave, and how do you position around that now? We believe so. Uh, we believe overall, taking a step back, AI is a multi-year uh, circular trend uh, at this point on, not just the hardware, but also on software. Now, when you talk about the uh, supply chain, uh, Asia is definitely the right place to be. You know, there's uh, J uh, Japan, there's South Korea, there's Taiwan. So all these, uh, you know, exporters located, you know, in these markets are, you know, quite well equipped to, uh, to, to, to ride this uh, circular wave. All right, Chris, great to have you. Chris Z there, Head of Equity Advisory Asia at BNP Paribas Wealth Management. Just want to recap what we heard when it comes to the RBNZ. So, yes, it, that Kiwi continued to be on the weak side here this morning, just given the, some of the commentary that we got. So, less risk or less reason to hike uh, this year. And they're talking about that peak rate of 5.6% now, uh, according to some of these projections. So, that has been a cut to the previous uh, predictions before from the board. Dovish. Rate yes. swaps, uh, extending the drop along with the currency, as you can see on your screens. This should be maybe risk positive uh, as far as that goes. All right, uh, a couple of other things we're tracking at this point. Singapore coming online this hour. You have a few shares that stocks we're tracking. The OCBC out with earnings. Olam is up 8.3%. That's a buyback. That's a profit story uh, as well. So su suffice to say, apart from the banks, of course, it's so far been net positive. Well, two out of three, at least on your screen so far. There yep, we go. And we got the CFO from Capital Land joining us. Uh, in just a few hours as well. Still ahead, we got UBS Global Wealth Management telling us where they see medium to long-term opportunities in China. We're also speaking exclusively to the Thai Airways CEO as the Aviation Festival Asia gets underway in Singapore. We're also counting down to the open of trade in Shanghai, Shenzhen, and Hong Kong. Uh, we are, of course, counting down to not just Baidu earnings, but also earnings from Galaxy. We've got that Hong Kong budget coming out in just about two hours or so. The financial secretary, Paul Chan, is going to be making his speech. We're looking for everything from the tourism sector to property in focus. A50 Futures flat this morning. This is Bloomberg. Welcome back to shows. 15 minutes from the opening bell. Futures are pointing lower, as you see on your screens. A50, the contract here in Hong Kong, which is, uh, I guess, double the declines we're seeing on the contract in Singapore. Ten-year yield at 237. Uh, just keep in mind that 2.2% level is roughly your record low, and we're not far away from that, given the policy stance and direction of travel and rates, which is still down at this Point in time. All right, the RMB fix of the day is out. Let me just have a look. And we are getting a, uh, I mean, under, we could just rewrite the headline from yesterday. <laughs> 710 75 against the US dollar. Yep, and you take a look at what it comes to your agenda here today. So we talked about that CGB rally. I think the 30 year continues to see yields heading lower. Uh, I think it's about six, seven, seven days, days now. now. Yeah. Um, so we'll see that market rebound. The stock market continues for another day as well. We certainly saw that revive itself, uh, especially when it comes to what we saw in the onshore markets. Remember volatility we're watching out for. Uh, Baidu earnings. Uh, you have AI stocks, gaming stocks. There were more approvals coming through from regulators. So we're watching Tencent, watching NetEase. Uh, also, when it comes to Galaxy Entertainment, so some of the Macau casinos are start uh, reporting as well. And then, of course, we talked about the budget coming up here in Hong Kong. So not just what stimulus measures we could see, but also we are going to get some data as well, growth figures. Yeah, too. GDP numbers later later on today. And within that, of course, Yvonne is pointing out. So earnings, like Sun Hung Kai is coming out with earnings as well. Sun Hung Kai, sorry. Uh, and that takes us to the property story in Hong Kong. Anyway, we can shelve that for now <laughs> and have a look at Alibaba. That's the other big story we're tracking. So, well, the company's led the largest single 
financing round for a Chinese AI startup joining Tencent and Microsoft in placing their big bets on AI. Let's bring in Jane Zhang. Uh, has a story for us. Uh, yeah, so how big's the deal? What are they doing? They're betting big on AI. Yes, mm. the deal is over $1 billion, mm. and the valuation of the company has jumped from $300 million mm. from last year to $2.5 billion this year. Wow. So it's a big jump within one year. The company has, was actually founded in March 2023. They raised three rounds, so this is really it's a It's not boom. even a year old. <laughs> yes. Exactly. Uh, tell us a little bit more about Moonshot. Ah. AI. Yes. I mean, what are they developing, um, and what are some of the other prominent AI startups that we should be really kind of paying our attention to in China? Yeah, Moonshot AI is, bu- uh, is based in Beijing and was founded in March 2023. And so far, it has developed a ChatGPT-like Kimi chat box, and that was launching last November. Mm. And later, they have launched another developers platform for developers to develop uh, AI applications on top of its uh, large language models. So that's basically what we know about their products, not really much. Uh, in terms of uh, other like prominent AI startups in China, uh, those one under my radar are really the ones either raised uh, have raised a, a large amount of money or they have gotten the government's approval to roll out their services to the public. So that said, it's Bai Chuan, uh, founded by uh, Sogo Engine founder Wang Xiaochuan, and uh, Zero Point AI, founded by Kai Fu Li, mm-hmm. and also a uh, Beijing-based Jipu AI, and uh, and another Shanghai-based AI startup called Minimax. Okay, so I think Yvonne talked about Baidu reporting earnings today. That takes us into, you know, the broader question. So apart from Alibaba, we know what Baidu's doing on AI. Uh, what other endeavors are the Chinese tech giants doing as far as the AI is concerned? Yeah, I think the, all the other, some uh, big Chinese tech giants are taking a similar approach like Alibaba's, mm-hmm. like Baidu and Tencent. They are actively developing their in-house projects uh, like Tencent has its Huiyuan, uh, Baidu has its early chatbot, but at the same time they are actively investing in high-flying startups outside like Tencent. It also invested in Minimax and Baichuan as I mentioned. So, but I think one big obstacle here is the computing power. That's a common challenge for all Chinese startups and tech giants. Mm. Um, Alibaba even cited this as one of the major reasons that they dropped the cloud business spin off. So, from this single case, we can see how big the challenge is. All right. Jane, thank you, Jane Zhang, there, our technology reporter on what to expect. She's talked about Baidu. We've got to talk about those earnings that are coming yeah. up as well. Um, I, I think the general sort of feel is that they might underwhelm once again. And it's really kind of driven by the fact that, you know, this is at the end of the day, it's, it's about advertising. And when you have a slowing economy, certainly that doesn't bode well uh, for its core business. But certainly anything on AI, we'll see if that sparks any sort of turnaround. Yeah, because that, that seems to be... You know, the offset, when you, yeah. Where you look at the stock is trading, right? And you compare it, I think we had another graphic earlier on, if, if not here, you know, how the valuation the market is attaching to a company like Baidu yeah. that wants to get into AI and uh, NVIDIA is the extreme, the other extreme example. It doesn't seem like you're talking about two companies in the same industry yeah. itself. So anything on AI is going to be interesting. Yeah. Uh, speaking of, there we go. Thank you so much. Fantastic work from our producers there. Uh, the other thing, though, is on AI, the scoop on on, on, on Apple. Yeah, I was going to say, that's why you have Citron Research saying Baidu is the most underappreciated AI stock right now because of that chart, (laughs) right? You have Benchmark, (laughs) that that analyst, um, also talking about how, you know, the price target is 210. Uh, that's for that stock in particular. So there, it seems to be some more room for upside here. But yeah, we're still expecting in terms of earnings. Uh, it's expected to have expanded by the slowest rate in a year. But Apple, that's the story, right? Hmm. I mean, they're shutting off the whole EV sort of projects and really tilting towards AI. Just, just goes to show, yes, they're playing a bit of catch up now, too. Some of the staff and the car teams will move to the AI division, yeah. quite, quite literally pivoting 180 degrees from that. Uh, they've been doing this, of course, for about a decade long, the EV Endeavor. Uh, it, it's known as Titan, I believe, if I'm not mistaken here. By the way, this is not official. It's based on sources that we've spoken with. This is a Bloomberg scoop, of course. Our colleague, Mark Kummer, Kerman, and his fantastic, uh, fantastic reporting there. Yeah, there we go. So, unsurprisingly, everyone is getting in, uh, going in big. Yeah. 
on AI. It certainly is a theme here today. All right. Uh, we're, so watching Apple suppliers, if there is any sort of reaction to this scoop, of course, and we're also tracking some other corporate stories today. Chinese chip maker Fujian Jinhua integrated circuit has been cleared of economic espionage and other criminal charges by a U.S. judge. The verdict comes more than five years after the firm was blacklisted as a threat to national security. Prosecutors had alleged Fujian Jinhua stole secrets from Micron. eBay shares jumped in late trade with a strong holiday quarter, giving investors fresh hope following steep job cuts. Fourth quarter profit was $1.07 a share on sales of $2.56 billion, both being the average estimate. eBay also added $2 billion to its existing stock buyback program. And we were talking about dating app Bumble. Shares tumbled after the bell as for its revenue forecast for the current quarter of up to $268 million fell short of estimates. It's also cutting about a third of its workforce, or about 350 roles globally, as it seeks to revive slowing user growth. Bumble says the cuts will help centralize engineering and product teams in fewer locations. Okay, coming online, Hang Seng. Index up actually a quarter of one percent right now, so we should be not 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 on track at this point in time, but we should be headed in that direction to reverse year-to-date losses. A50 futures have now flipped slightly into the positive right now. Dollar China slightly on the stronger side. You want against the Chinese currency. We're looking at a couple of things. We'll preview the trading day ahead, including some big moves in Chinese property on the big news on Country Garden earlier on. Plenty more ahead. This is Bloomberg. Country Garden, that's the one here. Pre-market, we are seeing those shares fall after getting that winding up petition in Hong Kong. And this is due to that uh, default that we saw on some of the dollar bonds back in October. So we're hearing this now. We'll watch the rest of the property space very closely. Uh, not just China, but really Hong Kong, given the budget is just a few hours away. Uh, also watching AI stocks. Tech in particular, Baidu is certainly the one to watch here when it comes to earnings and where they are in terms of this AI story. Alibaba, we talked about that moonshot program and their you know, big, big, big bet into AI and generative AI. Uh, Tencent NetEase, that's the one to watch. So it's a third straight month we've seen regulators approve domestic games. Uh, so certainly Tencent and NetEase are the ones of the beneficiaries. And yes, there is a little anticipation of maybe some support measures coming here to Hong Kong for the developers to really bring back this uh, and revive this property market, you already seen the likes of Henderson Land up close to 1%. Yep, one to watch. Uh, we're looking at some analyst actions here, uh, certainly going into today. So we talked about AI and certainly policy support there. Uh, ZT was a big, yeah. big, big move up yesterday. JP Morgan raising this one to neutral on the back of the price. But other things are tracking. Yeah, Link Reed, so the Hong Kong property developers certainly raised to a buy at CLSA too, as well. Qingdao Brewery, those eight shares raised to overweight at Morgan Stanley. Here we go, going into the open today, just under four, going into three minutes away. Hang Seng index up a quarter of one percent. We are nearing the starting point of the year, which means we are close to reversing all the losses so far in 2024. The Open is next. This is Bloomberg. Uh, it feels like a new day, doesn't it? It is. Busy day. There we go. Wednesday session. Uh, it's just ahead, counting down to the open of trades. Uh, uh, earnings in focus. Baidu, Galaxy, Sunungkai is coming out with earnings. The latest Bloomberg economic survey for China, Feb, that goes into the NPC, among other things. And we're, I mean, you have a very long list of stuff you're watching. You were <laughs> running all over the place. Like, I don't know what I want. There's a lot. Yeah. Um, you know, you take a look at not just the budget, yeah. and then you have to talk a little bit more about what we're seeing across this equity market. Market, which basically now the offshore market is really catching up with what we saw in the CSI 300 and basically all those losses that you saw for this year evaporated, right? And so we're watching the Hang Seng. That's the next benchmark to watch and whether we do reach that milestone as well. So certainly there's a lot on tap here, whether it's earnings, whether it's the, you know, policy-wise, maybe we're, we're in a little bit of a lull until we get to NBC, but certainly there's a lot of hanging on whether this is going to be the big catalyst to keep this rally from going um, further. So 8 tens of 1% upside for HS Tech. We talked about Hang saying we're up about a third of 1%, so just above that 
16,800 level. MSCI China and CSI 300 slow going here this morning, though. Uh, we're watching Shanghai crude. That's up about 1.6 percent. Iron ore is also recovering. We're seeing 1 percent in, in the futures in Dalian. And CGBs, not going a whole lot. Uh, as well. But it's interesting. The China Today column did talk about all the state support, all this kind of focus on the equity market. Our bonds now going to be at risk now. We're not quite seeing that, particularly when it comes to long end so far. Dollar China is at 721 this morning, so it is a little bit on the weaker side here, but we did see another day of a strong fix in terms of sector by sector. So we have everything from property stocks, tourism, related gaming. tech space, gaming, Baidu, AI, or even just uh, when it comes to chips. those gaming approvals, chips. Yesterday, there was all this the statement talking about uh, more, I think, regulatory support, uh, developing its own domestic industry. So we saw some of these, you know, the ZTEs and all that really was limit up yesterday. We'll see if we see another day of that. Here we go. Here's the tech space in particular. Mm -hmm. Baidu, Baba, Tencent, NetEase. Those all might be moving here this morning, of course. Baidu, we talked about how, you know, there, there might be a chance that they might disappoint again. But that stock is up some 2% leading up to those results. Alibaba, of course, with that moonshot program. Tencent is doing a slightly lower, but there you go. NetEase seems to be really liking the fact that we saw those gaming approvals getting the green light. So, yes, so I think it was NetEase I got one, Tencent as well, and 111 total domestic games that were okayed, and it's the third straight month that regulators have done this. So certainly that, that maybe bodes well for the, the gaming sector here today. Lee Auto, there you go. So I thought it was like 20... 20% gains or more yesterday on crazy. those earnings. We're, we're continuing that for today. We're up 3% for that stock. And, of course, those chip stocks still doing pretty well. Uh, ZTE is doing the other direction. But dawning information industry, that was limited up yesterday. We're seeing close to 9% gains, too. And, of course, the property developers in Hong Kong. Uh, so Country Garden certainly is one with the, the, what we saw with the wind-up petition. Sun Hong Kai is coming with earnings. You have CK Asset, Chow Tai Fook, Sa Sa. So everything from the tourism to also property. We're watching for clues of what Paul Chan is going to unveil in that budget in just a few hours' time. Yep, there we go, 90 uh, minutes from now. As Yvonne is pointing out, Country Garden, bottom of your skin is going to come up again. We were down 6%. Uh, just a, a couple of seconds back, we still should be doing that as well. So we've received, well, certainly the big news in the last, what, 40 minutes or so. So the company has received a winding up petition here uh, in Hong Kong. Let's bring in, there we go, 4%. Now let's bring in Loretta Chen here on set with us to talk us through the story. So what do we know so far here? Um, so the person, the company that filed the winding up is a unit uh, owned by Hong Kong listed King Board called Evercredit. And it seems like it's about a dispute of uh, 1.6 billion Hong Kong dollar loan between Country Garden and the company. So on the surface, it does seem like it's a dispute between two companies. And then Country Garden did emphasize in that statement that it doesn't represent the the benefit of the other creditors. So, so uh, Country Garden is in discussion with the other creditors about a coalition restructuring plan. What does this mean for the restructuring process then? Um, so, so just to dial back a little bit, usually companies file these winding up petitions for developers because they want to gain more say in their debt. Um, so in the case of uh, Evercredit King Board, it could be just to, you know, win that head, head, uh, sort of, uh, headway uh, in terms of getting some payment back from Country Garden. And then that would affect other creditors in terms of getting their payment as well. So, so in terms of, uh, you know, the scale here, I don't think that 1.6 billion Hong Kong dollars is going to tip the scale uh, for Country Garden. So um, I think the country, the company is still trying to prioritize the other creditors in terms of, you know, getting that restructuring talks ahead. And we hope to hear more updates from the company also in terms of where that restructuring uh, talk is going. Mm. Loretta, thank you so much. Our bond and loan reporter there, Loretta Chen, um, uh, certainly worth pointing out, uh, the company itself said the petition won't impact their ability to deliver uh, those homes. Right, let's bring in um, Eva Lee out of UBS, of course, head of Greater China Equities at the bank, Global Wealth Management Chief Investment Office. Nice to see you and good morning. Yep, morning. We're about 16% into this mm. Hang Seng China index from the bottom rally. Yeah. Typically, this tends to mark the end of the movie from the last 12 months, looking at no spirits. Does this feel any different, this, this current rally? Is there anything different about this? Well, I mean, um, this rally definitely remind me of what happened in 2015, when national team were actively buying in the Asia market. The only difference is this time, 
they buy they bought ETF mainly. Um, I, well, from the market chatter, they also bought it through the North Bound, yeah. but that was small portion. The main part is still the Asia. And obviously, the reason for that sharp rally, we all understand, because there were loads of shorts within the offshore market. So people, you know, actively cover the shorts. So that's why the market rebound was so notable. So what, what can make this last? I mean, you need to have that implementation of policy. MPC seems to be the next catalyst. Correct. You have a whole list of potential triggers here that could actually lead to this rally to continue. I want to fire it up real quick. Everything from what we're seeing, the property market support measures there, uh, capital markets and the like on state support. I mean, what is going to be most pressing for you? Well, I think we all talk about the three important, uh, you know, sort of sectors that China need to revive. Uh, obviously, look after the property sector. The property sales still is very weak. We need more support there. Second is the uh, local government bond LGFE, uh, and then lastly, of course, is the overall sentiment and the consumption side. So, if in the MPC, if we see more, not just easing of measure, we already have easing of property measure. We need something like uh, look back and last time they actually give out incentives for people to buy in the open market, physical market. So that's something, if they put it part of the urban redevelopment, that's important. Second, of course, they have a plan of what they would do with the local government debt. And lastly, of course, the consumption. There were talks about uh, something old trade for new and then encourage people to buy home appliances. You know, if they have actual measures from the central government, these will be the strategy that will sustain, you know, the recovery of China. So there could be upside here. Are we like, risk reward at this point in time? 16% and NPCs next week. We know what they might say, consensus on growth, whatever. Um, wh how do you think we look on the other side of it? Well, at, at the moment, you know, we got disappointed a few times, not a few times, yeah. quite I many was times. Say it, but you did. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and as a result, we cannot be, well, you know, immediately move to the, the, what we call the upside scenario. We wanted to say in the base case and the moment and, you know, sort of more of a defensive, like I stay with the utilities, I stay with the mm -hmm. banks that give me yields, and then I have a little bit of growth exposure. If we were, if we are moving to the upside, that would add more of the growth exposure. That's not too late for it, because it's still cheap if you look at the entire market in terms of valuation. Um, you, you mentioned about Hong Kong, um, that, that yield support. How important is it to have a bit of dividend play to cushion some of the volatility that we've seen? Oh, it's important. Uh, like, I, we did a measure. We checked uh, particularly the SOE for those yield stocks since the beginning of 2023, they outperformed the overall MSCI China by 19%. Mm. So they are, you know, these are the support. And in fact, if you look back, what type of stocks that national team sort of focus on is still those big cap SOE yield stocks. So in a way, in sort of two spectrum, it support, you know, that theme in terms of, you know, focusing on yield. I, I think Part of that might also be the, I mean, financials, right, within Hong Kong. Yeah. And we have the budget coming up today. And I'm wondering, do you see any cat potential catalysts fr from, from the budget today? Well, I have no clue. I don't know whether they would do anything with the property. I think that's, uh, it's needed. But I can understand for other reasons they don't want to ease further, particular they just ease in October. Um, more, to, you know, actual support to the, you know, to the economy. I don't think they will give up more consumption vouchers, which they already have done, but something, you know, important that will sort of strengthen the economic base of Hong Kong. I yeah. think that is needed. Uh, what about overall just earnings uh, in greater China right now? I mean, obviously, we, we, the policy signals could be a good catalyst, but the downward earnings revisions, that story hasn't changed too much in some ways. Is that already been priced in? Um, it's, it, it, it was already pricing, but always, whenever there is a disappointment on result season, it will still impact the share price. And you're right. In fact, this is also one of the crucial factors that could really drive the sustained rally. Because at the moment, we still see negative uh, earnings revisions coming through. Mm. And in fact, if you talk about fourth quarter, the economy is weak. I don't know whether we are still seeing more revision on both fourth quarter, like 2023, and also if we do not see anything major from MPC, maybe we'll see more downward revision in 24 as well. We, we've started to hear more, 
and I want to get your thoughts on you know the regulatory cycle. We've we've started to hear more whether that's official media or actual announcements on just positive news coming out on on several industries, right? So whether it's AI chips, gaming's a good example today. Net eases up. Are there certain sectors that stand out to you as perhaps having the best, most positive policy tailwind this year? Mm. Um, if we sort of moving on medium to longer term, you know, definitely AI, mm. uh, domestic chip, because you know that given the restrictions from US, China will continue to strengthen its domestic you know, supply chain on chip manufacturing, um, industrial automations, uh, local basic broad mass consumptions. So that is also part of the um, you know, next five or 10 year plan. Um, you know, the, these, these are key words. Of course, I mean, some companies that have foreign exposure, established exposure, but outside of U.S., because I don't think you want to want any exposure in U.S. in the year of election. Um, yeah, I think that there are companies that are having that strength in the, um, you know, international market as well. I was going to ask you about the U.S. election. I mean, obviously, there's been talk about what it can mean for the fiscal side of things, but even when it comes to trade, right? If there's, mm. if people are talking about 60% imposition of tariffs um, for if Trump wins again. What does that mean for the market? Well, I think even his talks will already send the market down, right? I mean, even though it's not even, you know, sort of implemented, imposed in the market. But having said that, this will be a year of a lot of noises because that's, you know, that's part of the presidential campaign, right? Yeah. And as a result, um, we need, really need to uh, sort of focus on domestic area. So it's sort of sheared away from the international, any companies having strong, a lot of international, particular U.S. exposure. Eva, great to have you. Eva Lee there, head of Greater China Equities at UBS Global Wealth Management Chief Investment Office. Well, coming up next, our exclusive interview with the Thai Airways CEO on their growth plans after a recent order for dozens of Boeing jets. We're live at the Aviation Festival Asia in Singapore. Checking these markets, of course, New Zealand assets very much in focus, just given that less hawkish commentary coming through from the RBNZ. Less risk of a rate hike this year. The markets are moving. The Kiwi has sank. And you take a look at what it comes to yields are lower by 12 basis points on the two-year. We're at 482 here this morning. And really, if you compare that with what we've been seeing with softer inflation prints of Australia, those rate cut bets out of Australia for the RBA also being pushed for it now too, Dave. Similar dynamic. Uh, and maybe we're coalescing around well, one, New Zealand and RBA, and maybe three for the Fed. The, yeah. For our clients, TLIB Go, plus, of course, in the next hour, the briefing starts. This is Bloomberg. Good morning from the Asia Pacific. It's almost 10 a.m. in Hong Kong and in Singapore. 11 a.m. if you're watching us out of Tokyo. Welcome to Bloomberg Markets Asia. I'm David Inglis. What do you want? Our top stories this morning. The Kiwi dollar slips as the RBNZ holds rates and flags a lower risk of a hike this year. Aussie inflation, meanwhile, holding steady in January. Country Garden slapped with a winding up petition in Hong Kong after the distressed developer defaulted on a dollar bond last year. Plus, Apple shares gain as Bloomberg reveals a tech giant canceling its decade-long effort to develop an electric car and shifting to AI. Yep, there we go. So the AI theme continues to play uh, certainly a big part of the market narrative today and certainly Baidu, which reports earnings today. We'll get to that in a moment. There's a story about Alibaba, of course, and that uh, massive bet they're doing in the private markets. Uh, we'll set that aside for now. Markets, though, are on, on offer, mostly. Hang Seng is flat. Regional benchmarks down about a quarter of, well, a fifth of one percent right now. Flip the boards, please. Uh, we're coming off a, an afternoon rally in Chinese markets yesterday, hence why we're looking at almost, almost a 5,800 level uh, print on the Hang Seng China Index, which basically puts us back to levels at the start of the year. We'll get to the RBNZ in just a moment. They're fairly dovish tilt.
uh, coming through. Ten-year yield at 430. We're now looking at uh, three cuts. Only three cuts is a better way to frame that uh, price on swaps market. And in Bitcoin, of course, we're still looking at that. 60,000 level, we're coming off highs of today. We were trading at 57,000 earlier, early on there. Yep, so certainly that is the one to watch when it comes to Bitcoin, AI, as we talked about, and uh, really the Fed pricing that we've seen, mm. right? So now when you have less hawkish commentary from the RB and Z, it kind of bodes well with the, the Fed and really what, finally, it seems like the markets are listening mm. to what the Fed yeah. says, right? We want, as you mentioned, we went from set, you know, pricing in seven cuts to six and now three which is basically what the dots have suggested. So, you know, have we seen more of a balanced sort of view when it comes to yields now? And does that limit the sort of the upside risk of, of yields heading higher now, too? Yeah, I mean, arguably, right? It's what the dots were showing. Uh, we get a lot of Fed speakers coming through on Thursday and Friday in particular. Uh, and speaking of, yeah, speaking of central bankers speaking right now, there we go. Just starting right now, and this is someone, of course, we'll be speaking with uh, tomorrow, outlining maybe the rationale behind, well, not just the, it wasn't so much that they didn't do anything. It's the forecasts on the RBNZ show. Oh, yes. They're probably at the peak and may start cutting rates um, first half of next year. Yeah, so it basically means they might not do anything for the rest of this year. Mm -hmm. Um, and 2025, I think the peak rate was at five point. I forgot that. A little bit above right now, but yeah. yeah. So yeah. that was a bit of a, a downward revision there from some of the the projections that were initially made. So certainly, uh, even though they're they're sounding slightly with a hawkish, you know, they they try to they don't want to maintain like it's a full dovish mode. Yeah. Uh, they did have some commentary talking about you know they may still hike or, or they may still look at this very uh, data dependently. But certainly there is the a side of the market really not buying into this sort of bluff from the RBNZ at the moment. So we'll continue to see what Adrian Orr says. We have a big interview coming up tomorrow with the governor himself too. There we go. Uh, global macro movers, before that, I think we're going to show you the pricing around swaps in the Fed and ahead of the flurry of speakers we'll be getting today and uh, tomorrow. Uh, global macro movers, as you can see on your screens, it's a big earnings theme, by the way, since you may be looking at Singapore, which is top left of your screens. OCBC uh, reporting should be down. Kiwi dollar, again, reminding us that's the story to track FX markets and bonds. We're down 10 basis points. Is that the five year? Yes, that is the five year. Right now. Okay, let's uh, talk about markets. We're about five or six weeks into this rally in the region. Consolidation so far, first two days of this week. Catherine Young is with us here on set, investment director at Fidelity International. Nice to see you. Nice to see you guys. So how are you thinking about equity markets right now? Well, you know, things don't change for me all the time. So China still remains one of our preferred markets. Um, That's worked well. It hasn't worked well in general over the years, but valuations are looking incredibly attractive across a number of sectors. But even if you look past valuations, I know sentiment remains somewhat dire, relatively better than where we were, let's say, four months ago. Uh, but I think that when you look at what the companies themselves are doing, uh, it, it's, it's hard to ignore, especially when, unless you think that China isn't going to be the second largest economy in the world, or even the largest economy in the world, it's hard not to have some kind of Chinese exposure, whether it's fixed income or indeed equities. What I would just be hesitant about, though, is this whole massive momentum towards AI, obviously playing out very much in Taiwan, not just the pure AI plays, but any tech company that happens to have any kind of AI associated with it. Why do you think so? Uh, the margin of safety yeah. is, has really decreased, and the valuations are at the extreme end of, let's say, the Chinese valuations, where they're looking incredibly toppy and, and very heavily owned, and as I said, that momentum yeah. trade's playing out. Mm. Well, let, let's meet in the middle. Japan seems to be a place where things did look expensive. I mean, mm. comparably, people were looking at Japan and India in one basket last year. Mm. Why is India expensive and why is Japan not expensive? Mm. I guess it's that sort of, you know, that Japan still needs to prove itself in terms of we went through decades of, of sort of lost growth. Uh, what's really refreshing in Japan is that this corporate governance revival is, is really tangible and occurring and the exchange is very much behind it. Even sentiment, like on the ground in terms of inflation isn't necessarily a bad thing anymore in Japan. Yeah. So I think that long-term runway for growth is very much there. India, as you mentioned, it feels a bit momentum-driven. Um, and again, not a lot of risk is being factored into current valuations. Um, how, how does, you, know, you say something that's changed in your view is robotics and automation. That's been interesting. Uh, what's that story there that you're seeing now? So before we started seeing the decline in Chinese equities, um, 
the main Chinese or robotic or automation names were trading at somewhat of a premium to the dominant players, which are Germany and Japan. And if you look back 45 years ago, it was Germany and Japan that really started in this area. Only 10 years ago that the Chinese companies made a pivot away from motors to, let's say, the joints of robotics. Yeah. And what they're doing in terms of the servicing towards their customers, so engineers going on site, the progress that they've made in this decade is fascinating. And unlike other sectors where you've seen China really ramp up manufacturing-wise, the barriers um, are very, very high. And that's where China is likely to really continue to dominate in that high-end value manufacturing and getting some policy support too. What does that runway look like for these companies? Because you mentioned Japan and Germany were the only players over the last, what, half century really in this space. And if you, if you take that and you look at the runway for China, that, that seems to be a very good longer term proposition really, if yeah. they manage to replicate what, what the Japanese key. and Germans did. Yeah, and that's why they're looking at how else they can take market share away from the dominant players by, for example, servicing. I think it's a fascinating area. And again, when you look at their global market share, it's only low single digits. People say, oh, China's really, really ramping up in this space. Mm. But it's still very low, and a lot of the revenue is still being derived from China. So that domestic China story, I know a lot of Chinese companies are now going overseas for customers and, and winning contracts. But that domestic China story, because it's so ignored and sentiment so dire towards it. I think there are a lot of, uh, there's a lot of potential upside in that space. Okay. Uh, just hold on, we just have some breaking lines crossing in this uh, press briefing with the RBNZ Governor Adrian Orr, uh, talking just a little bit about what, what held and what was happening behind those closed doors during this decision and what led to that hold. Uh, they said we did discuss a rate hike, certainly not a cut. So for you traders out there, don't get ahead of yourselves. Yeah. They're saying basically yeah. their comfortable yeah. consensus around a hold for now, which I think basically what they've been projecting Right, rates might just stay uh, at, at this rate for, for the rest of this year in some ways as well. So don't get ahead of yourselves. Um, the market certainly did get ahead of themselves, Catherine, when it comes to rate cuts and what the Fed was going to do this year. That's repriced a bit. Mm -hmm. But the equity market hasn't really caught on to that. Do you yeah. think that, that likely can, can stay the course, so where equities can still you know, nudge higher versus bonds in some oh, ways? It just seems so buoyant in terms yeah. of the U.S. So I, I think you might see somewhat of a pullback. And it's almost the exact opposite in China, right, where the Chinese um, equities market's trading at such an attractive valuation versus from an asset allocation point of view, mm -hmm. fixed income. And in fact, the Chinese bond market's been one of the best performing bond markets. Yeah. So we're seeing a lot of diversion in both the U.S. market versus, versus China. Will, will equity markets be okay this year if we don't get any cuts? Yeah. RBNZ says we'll probably be at these levels for a longer time, maybe the RBA. Uh, who knows when the rest of Asia Pacific starts cutting rates. Maybe the Fed doesn't even move this year. That's an extreme case, of course. But what does a macro outlook look like to you? Does a macro outlook matter at this point? It feels we got a bit ahead of ourselves last year, with the exception of, let's say, the PBOC. And people are just continually are disappointed with the lack of action, even though we are seeing continual tweaks accommodated policy-wise. So I think, you know, the policymakers are probably debating globally, looking at the data coming through. But I think markets were probably being a little bit too optimistic about whether you're seeing banks um, cut or, or hike. So I think we need to go back to the fundamentals of the companies and those companies that can survive and grow their earnings in an kind of environment. Mm. Uh, we, we talked about Korea this week, obviously with this value up sort of yeah. petition to really kind of bring up the whole corporate governance sort of regime that, that Japan mm. has really kind of started to materialize now. Um, you know, it seems like this whole regime doesn't, didn't really quite live up to expectations in some ways. Um, but in terms of, you know, what you're seeing so far, is it enough to kind of bring down or at least reduce that Korea discount that we see in this market? The scope for improvement is huge, so we're hopeful. But we really do need to see tangible and concrete action when it comes to the levels of corporate governance standards in Korea. And that's why the markets tended to trade at such a large discount versus other markets. So if they can get their messaging and, and actual tangible actions in place like we've seen in Japan, and don't forget China's been doing the same in terms of some of the SOEs, but that's kind of gone on notice because of sentiment towards China, that's then right. Korea does look very, very attractive. But we will actually have to see tax changes and, and sort of, as I said, actions to improve that level of corporate governance. Mm -hmm. All right, Catherine, great to have you. Catherine, mm -hmm. Catherine Yuan, their investment director at Fidelity International. Um, we're checking when it comes to uh, all things uh, foreign exchange here at this moment, just given some of these lines that are crossing from the RBNZ. Obviously, the yen has been a key focus this week as well. Let's bring in our FX and race strategist, David Finnerty, joining us now. Uh, let's talk about the Kiwi first on the back that, you know, given what Adrian Orr has been saying, 
uh, you know, trying to push back some of the, 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 the movement that in the price action that we're seeing right now, right? That they were, they thought about a rate hike, but certainly not a rate cut. But the market seems to be ignoring that here right now, David. What's the outlook for the Kiwi now moving forward? Well, so, as you said, the markets are very biased towards rate cuts. We know that. And if you open the door, the markets happy run through it. Although, having been fair here, the key thing really is that the probability of a rate hike is being reduced. And really, that's what the market's heavily focusing on. The OCR track has been slightly lowered. Not a lot. It's still a, a rate hike is left on the table, bar B and Z. But the markets definitely notice that there's less probability of a rate hike. And with the idea of being mooted of a rate cut next year, obviously, that's uh, two negative is making a positive, shall we say, for uh, traders. So they're very happy to run with that idea. Having said that, the Kiwi, in terms of against the dollar, really fit to push much lower here. It really depends, I think, on what the US PCE data comes out tomorrow. It needs to come out very high because the market's now pricing this back in line with the Fed for three rate cuts this year. So unless markets could get even more hawkish, it's really tough for the dollar side of the equation to rally. So at the moment, Kiwi dollar is around 61. I think the near low term, maybe in the 60 area, but even that may be too steep. So I think for really um, that FX pair to push much lower, you need the dollar side for dollar to really uh, get a boost from PCE tomorrow. David, apart from I guess the the price action today, which was was expected because markets had to simply adjust to these new forecasts coming out of the RBNZ. And I guess my question there is, you know, if only we had listened to the previous forecast, if only markets looked at the Fed dot plot as another example, uh, we wouldn't have such violent sort of adjustments. I guess my question there is, how much can we trust these forecasts? Because they seem to be changing quarter and quarter. How much do central banks actually know their economies look in three months' time? You know, I think that's a fairly good question. I think, you know, forecasts change. I think it's going to be interesting for the Fed stop plot next month. How much does that change? And, you know, mm. the debate is will the Fed cut? How much will the Fed cut this year? Again, I think the PC comes into it. Remember, you only need two people. At the last meeting, it was eight people going in the Fed saying two or fewer cuts, 11 saying three or more cuts. So you only need two people to switch from three or more cuts to two to suddenly for that median to go to two eight cuts next year. So the dot plot can move in it, and the Fed would say this, as will other central banks. It is a work in progress. Now, having said that, the central bank would say, look, we've been a lot more accurate than the market pricing has been. If you go to the Fed pricing, just in January, the market's looking for over six rate cuts this year. That's now been dialed back to three. So I think both sides of the equation will say, look, it is evolutionary. We are all data dependent. The markets will say, look, we are really trying to be forward link thinking. The Fed is trying to say you're too forward thinking and you're not actually guessing what, not listening to what we are saying. So I think really a, a bit of both of that fault. But if we're being honest so far, the central banks have been a bit more accurate than the market pricing has been. Uh, I was going to get your take on the yen, just given, you know, we had a, a, a decently hot, I guess you could say, inflation print yesterday. And yes, I mean, the market moved, but we're still talking about dollar yen at 150 right now, David. Um, it doesn't seem like yen is really moving that much or really buying this whole narrative that the BOJ is going to exit policy maybe in the few months or, or so. Uh, you know, is there still room for, for a yen rally here? Yeah, I think there is room for yen rally, but having said that, I wouldn't expect it near term. I said, go back to that PCE data again tomorrow. I think that would be the catalyst for dollar yen to rally or weaken. When it comes to the BOJ side of the equation, even with that slightly hot print on the Japan inflation data yesterday, no one's really expecting the BOJ to move at the earliest, really, until April. And it may even be a bit later than that, depending on how the Shinto wage negotiations go. So basically, even if it's April, that's still a few weeks away. And even if they move in April, arguably the market goes, OK, you go from you reduce negative interest rates, you go from minus 0.1 to zero. How much of an impact can that have? It's a bit already priced into the markets. So there is room for the, the yen side of the equation to rally. But I don't think it's extensive because I don't think the BOJ is going to come out and be exceedingly hawkish, certainly based off recent rhetoric. So on that side of the equation, for dollar yen really to weaken, you need red rate cuts to be priced back into the equation. You need to get back to four or five rate cuts. Now, the market's very happy to do that if the data gives it a chance to.
Dave, David, thank you so much. David Finnerty, our FX and rate strategist in Singapore for us. Stay tuned for an interview coming up tomorrow. RBNZ Governor, he's speaking right now. We'll be speaking with him tomorrow. Adrian Orr himself to go over today's decision and certainly what comes next for the Central Bank. 8.15 if you're watching out of Hong Kong. Just after 1 p.m. if you're watching us out of Wellington. We're still ahead this hour, we're going to preview Baidu's earnings and hear why BI, Bloomberg Technology, expects the results to be underwhelming this time. This is Bloomberg. Okay, it seems the floodgates have opened here. So we're now down 12, 11, 12 percent here in Country Garden. Biggest drop since the 12 percent drop that we had back in September of, of, of last year. News flow this morning. Not encouraging. Let's get into the news here. Loretta Chen, our bond and loan reporter, is here in our studio with us to talk us through this, what, this winding up petition. What do we know about it? Uh, we know there is a credit company called Evercredit um, that filed this winding up petition regarding a 1.6 billion Hong Kong dollar loan. Um, that uh, that company is owned by a Hong Kong listed company, Kingboard, and that company is sort of entangled in some different loan agreements with Country Garden, according to previous filings. So it seems like two companies are disputing about these private loans. Um, it's it's not currently involving any broader creditor group as far as we know. Hmm. So it might be just a, you know, one or two you know, single creditors. Does it impact the market in any way? This is coming at a time when the credit markets are turning a little bit more positive. Yeah, I think it comes at inconvenient timing for Country Garden because it's also in these restructuring talks with creditors. And that just takes us back to the example of Evergrande. It was also a very small creditor holding a very small portion of debt that filed that winding up petition, but eventually that, that small creditor managed to pit the other creditors against the company. So uh, the risks are tr definitely here for Country Garden, even if it's a small creditor. Mm -hmm. You know, if the creditors are finding themselves not going anywhere in terms of those restructuring discussion, then they could be on the side of that small creditor as well. Um, but we don't know uh, what the creditors are thinking so far, but I think institutional investors, based on their experience with uh, restructuring with these Chinese developers, they increasingly realize that actually winding up the company is one of the viable ways for them to get any sort of payment because rec recovery prospect is just so low. You look at Country Gardens bond, you know, trading at these single digits numbers, mm. uh, you know, they might as well just wind up the company. Okay, now if, if I'm a home buyer, I'm looking at the news, does this affect any delivery of any homes that I've purchased, if any, from Country Garden, for example? Has the company responded to that? Yeah, so the company definitely has put an emphasis that none of that home delivery process is going to get delayed. Well, the winding up happened in Hong Kong, so everything will take place in the offshore market. Okay. And Country Garden's funding uh, comes from onshore to these projects. I don't think any of that will be changed. And, uh, you know, the, the flag that they have 135 projects being put on that whitelist. Mm -hmm. And a month ago, you know, some local government started uh, picking some of these good quality project to put them on whitelist so they get prioritized for getting funding so I don't think any of that will change for Country Garden okay great Loretta thank you Loretta Chen there our bond and loan reporter joining us here of course we're watching not just Chinese property but also Hong Kong developers very much in focus here today so Country Garden certainly did see that leg lower when it comes to that stock uh, on the back of this wind-up petition but also any sort of signs that we're gonna hear from Paul Chan in the next hour or so on this budget to revive the property market is very much front and center here in Hong Kong. Uh, just given what we've been seeing in the housing market, given what we've seen in the tourism sector, those are the two sectors really to watch for signs of support from the government. So you are seeing at least some of these property developers move here this morning. Uh, Sun Kai, they have earnings coming out, keep in mind as well. But that one's down. The rest seem to be doing a little bit better. You have the likes of New World Development up close to 2%. This is Bloomberg. We had a, a good, productive conversation about AI and the future of technology, and I'm really excited for the work that is, uh, is happening here in Japan. 
All right, there he is, Zuck himself, the Meta CEO, uh, Mark Zuckerberg, speaking uh, at the Japanese Prime Minister Fumio Kishida's office. So that was work, Zuckerberg. Yeah, you know, he, he did some business. He did speak with that some was big a side leaders tour he out did. there. Yeah, but I, I mean, everyone I've been chasing really just what he's been doing outside of work, which yeah. has been really, really interesting, right? So yeah. uh, I think there was things about him making swords. Yeah. Um, then, then there was this one yesterday about him on Instagram going to a Japanese McDonald's, and and just loving it. There he is, making that sword. This is not a McDonald's, to be, to be clear. <laughs> there you go. Yeah, he was um, working up an appetite. Yeah, and then, and then he had to have lunch, right? And, and of course, uh, he's giving a big, big, nice review of, of McDonald's there in Japan, for those of you heading to that lunch break in Tokyo right now. Give these guys a Michelin star. Yeah. I love it. So he, I love it. He responded to this comment, right, on what the best item was. <laughs> On the menu, so I'm, I'm reading his, his, his response here. It's an empty burger. So good, 10, 10 out, out of 10. 10. <laughs> Double burger with egg, it's a banger. <laughs> 10 out of 10. Teriyaki McChicken, 8 out of 10. Local McNuggets, great <laughs> texture. 10 out of 10. The Churros for Dessert, 8 out of 10. Strong showing. <laughs> And guess what? Overall. Mr. David Inglis got McDonald's this morning because of that tweet, <laughs> yeah, uh, that, that, yeah, <laughs> that yeah. post. It wasn't my idea. No, it was. Um, it speaking was. of which, okay, I think he heads to Seoul next, though, right? So maybe some, some tweets about yes. Korean barbecue we'll coming see. up next. I'm maybe looking forward eyeliner. to that. I don't know. Cosmetics? Yeah. Who yeah. knows? <laughs> Let's do a market check real quick. Maybe get some Oh, wait, no, there's still that pre-wedding. So, so, there's, there's, so there's, there's the Seoul trip, and then at the end, it's, it's the pre-wedding. And I promise, the biggest pre-wedding of the century, <laughs> it's with... Of course, uh, the Mbani son, yeah. right? So um, if you look at the guest list of this, I mean, it's just dream, dream wedding seat chart right there, right? I wonder how they're all going to sit together. Yeah, who's well, yeah. going to get along? Everyone from Larry Fink, Bill Gates, Zach, of course, Bob Iger, Rihanna is going to perform, I think. I mean, dream. I expect some m and news after this, potentially, with, with everyone <laughs> with money. They, they took a page out of the World Economic Forum in Davos. And, maybe, and they're like, let's just replicate that. <laughs> yeah. Everyone coming up. Anyway, there we go. That's on the agenda today, in case you're wondering. That's our daily segment on Mark Zuckerberg's daily schedule. Uh, speaking of McDonald's in Japan, going into the break, doing this. Not that it should be moving the stock. There we go, 1.2%. But DNA is actually very interesting here. Uh, th this is after their Pokemon mobile game. Anyway, 25% to the upside. This is Bloomberg. All right. McDonald's Japan. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I forgot to say, it's catching a bit here this morning. I don't know if it's a Zuck effect or not, but it sounds like just given what he mentioned, he's had several meetings there, uh, meals there, I should say. <laughs> well, meetings too. <laughs> <laughs> maybe meals. Or maybe he's just eating them all in one go. I don't know. But all right, we're watching very closely what happens here today. So we're seeing a bit of a pullback here when it comes to equities. Dollar yen, I mean, yes, there's some strength, some strength. 150, though, we're still talking about. Um, yield's not doing a whole lot when it comes to that JGB. Uh, but yes, the rest of Asia, though, yeah, it's a bit of a pause still. Okay, uh, the dashboard is looking like this, including Japan, including U.S. futures. Uh, you're looking at the Bloomberg dollar index. There we go. So it's, I wouldn't say it's a rush to the exits. Uh, <laughs> certainly, caution is uh, the name of the game out there. Most sectors are down. Uh, Bitcoin, we're still focusing on that, 56, 57,000. Um, other things like oil, for example, there's some developments out of the Red Sea here and uh, some Houthi drones being, uh, being shot down. Uh, we're also looking in at the Chinese market, several reasons there. So number one is, as of the close yesterday, Hang Seng China Index actually is now back to square one. It's reversed all the losses so far this year. We could get there by the end of the week on the Hang Seng Index. A lot of that perhaps will depend on what happens in 30 minutes time when the Hong Kong budget comes out. And certainly there is a lot of speculation out there, certainly in some news reports that they might announce something further to support this ailing property market. Yep, so everything from tourism, everything from property, that's certainly one to watch. Uh, we're watching Apple suppliers if, if there is any sort of reaction to this Bloomberg scoop uh, of why they might be actually hitting the brakes when it comes to that EV project as well. So shifting more towards the AI side of the business, so said to be cancelling work when it comes to electric vehicles. Uh, we did see a movement in the stock, I guess, but we'll see how the rest of it plays out for, the, for tomorrow uh, in the U.S. But certainly that would be, Mark, a pretty 
pretty significant shift, Dave. After 10 years. Yeah. Apple suppliers trading across the region. Let's bring in the man who broke the story. Mark Gurman is with us, our tech reporter. Mark, fantastic reporting. Uh, take us through. What do we know? Yeah, thank you for having me. So on Tuesday morning in the U.S., in California, Apple gathered. It's about 2,000 employees working on this Apple car project, which kicked off a decade ago in 2014, to inform them that the project is being canceled and winding down. And this means there will be layoffs, uh, there will be people reorganized to other teams, and the company is focusing on other areas now, including generative AI, spatial computing with the Vision Pro, and software engineering for its core operating system. So this is a, a bombshell development. This is one of the most significant pieces of Apple news in a very long time. The market reacted positively to the news. Obviously, this was a cash burner for Apple. Uh, to your earlier point, I'm not sure how this would impact Apple's uh, suppliers in Asia because they hadn't gotten to the point of actually sourcing components. Uh, to me personally, I don't believe they were ever considering manufacturing the car in Asia. I think that was a European uh Thing in terms of the geography where that was happening, uh, but certainly this is a this is a bombshell. And, and Mark, I mean, we we have asked questions to analysts before about you know Apple seems to be, I guess, still needing to catch up when it comes to this whole AI um, development, right? Um, and the fact that they're you know abandoning the EVs and shifting potentially to generative AI, you know, strategically, is, is this going to be a bigger, better bet for the company? Mm -hmm. I don't think so. I don't think that shifting to AI is a better bet for the company than moving to a car. I think Apple has next to, to zero competency for successfully integrating generative AI into its products. I don't particularly think they're going to do a job that moves the needle. I don't think this is going to be a revenue generator for them at all. They're essentially abandoning their, their only hope in the next decade or two of a product that could potentially double their market cap and add 50%, 75% to their annual revenue. So, no, I don't think this is a, a positive for the company long term. I don't think they're placing their bets in the right areas. Okay, Mark, Mark, thank you so much, Mark Gurman there on a fantastic scoop. And as he was pointing out, positive market reaction. It's been, it's been a, a cash burner for Apple and quite some strong words are also coming out of Mark there that getting to this AI thing is probably not a good idea. This is not what they're good at. We'll see. We'll see what happens with that. Right. Baidu, Alibaba in focus too. Yeah, certainly the earnings are certainly one in focus here today. And, and you know, given that this is the, the AI play in China, uh, we had that great chart just now uh, comparing the, the performance of Baidu versus NVIDIA. And it, it, it's a massive gap. Mm, night and day. And perhaps while you are seeing the likes of Citron Reacher saying that is, the, you know, Baidu is still the most underappreciated stock when it comes to the AI sector as well. Uh, Bloomberg Intelligence uh, there expects Baidu to report another set of lackluster results following the weak third quarter number Let's bring in Robert Lee, our senior analyst, to join us now. We'll talk about Apple a little bit later on. I want to get your take on that. But Baidu first. Why do you think they're going to underwhelm? Uh, the reality for Baidu is it's a search engine business. And um, although they had some market leadership or uh, in, in, within the China context on the AI side, in aggregate their AI ventures are loss making. And the level of investment they will need to uh, put into their AI businesses or various AI businesses is likely to increase this year and therefore you get an increase in losses. But the reality is it's a search engine business whose revenues highly correlated to the economy, uh, advertising outlook, corporate outlook, etc. Yeah. So as a result, we're likely to see, you know, probably inline but weaker numbers with profit coming down and margins coming down quite significantly in the Q, into Q4. Right. Yeah. Uh, so let's set aside the AI part of the conversation for now because, as you point, it's yeah. still a search engine. So let's yeah. assume the worst, let's assume the AI operation goes down a toilet. That's an extreme scenario. Yeah. What does this company look like over the next five years? What's growth looking like as it looks right now? I guess if we had this conversation a year ago, again, with their market leadership before ChatGPT had been announced, before, before Alibaba, all the rest, yeah, then, yeah, you probably logically take the view that, yep, they've got great market leadership. They should able to, you know, be able to capitalize on that four to five year view. But I think it's become apparent that the barrier, technical barriers to entry on the software side, which is where they're focused, aren't particularly high. That's why every, you know, there are more than 200 large language models in China at the moment. 
and that they've gone from a zero start you know in, in a year to more than 200 companies having these models so the technical barrier to entry isn't there and Baidu's uh, lead is rapidly being eroded and I think ultimately the way these companies are trying to monetize their AI business is through cloud cloud is a scale business the scale leaders or hyper, potential hyperscalers in China cloud are the likes of Tencent and Alibaba. So I think it's those companies which are in a better position to lead in the long run within the China context, and unfortunately not Baidu. It just doesn't have the scale of resources to throw at the issue. Um, yeah. It's got some great IP, but again, the, the, the competition is narrowing the gap at a rapid pace because of the low technical barrier to entry on the software side. Yeah. So we mentioned that gap between Baidu and NVIDIA shares, right? I and mean, it's quite wide. Um, do you think that's justified then? Yeah, uh, well, clearly the market's telling you Baidu is not uh, NVIDIA. And if you look at the earnings outlook for both, you would, again, even if you knew nothing about AI companies, if you had some background in investing, you'd probably say, right, AI company, given the market backdrop, given the secular growth we're seeing in the sector, surely an AI company should be delivering double-digit earnings growth. I think that would be a reasonable starting assumption. You look at the sell side uh, estimates, consensus for the coming year, uh, consensus is looking for Baidu's earnings to come down just under 1%. So this is not a growth company, and unfortunately, its leading, once leading market position is being squeezed by the competition rapidly closing the gap. And so, yes, it, I don't think it is a fair comparison between the two, mm. and that's what the chart is telling you, uh, uh, or in speaking yeah. volumes. I mean, we were uh, talking about, just to McMark Gurman, about Apple really abandoning this whole EV project and really moving some of those resources to AI now. Interesting. I thought he was going to say this was a, a better bet for for yeah. for Apple, but he said no, not not really. I saw you kind of raising your eyebrows a little bit when he said that. Well, what's your initial take of this move? I, I think maybe I'm not wanting to put words in Mark's mouth. That um, yeah, a, a, a Apple is even though it's a, you know fantastic company, they're coming from behind in AI. Um, they have no uh, you know great um, lead on the the intellectual property or R and D side. They don't have a cloud business. These are aspects that all the other leading U.S. cloud or AI companies have at the moment. So whilst they're very successful in smartphones and consumer electronics, entering the AI, they're coming from behind. So there's a lot for them to prove. But I would say on a relative basis, is it better they focus their efforts in AI, which is clearly a secular growth story that will run for many years, or EVs? I think as we're seeing on the EV side, it's being increasingly dominated by the Chinese. Again, it's a volume business. The uh, benefits you get on the cost front are a key source of competitive advantage, and that's why uh, BYD has rapidly closed the gap and, in fact, overtaken Tesla now as the leading volume player on the global EV space. So unless, if, if Apple were to stick to the EV strategy, um, they'd have to really go at the premium end. But again, it's a very competitive market. Um, so I would say, as a relative choice, it probably is better to refocus on AI. But again, you've got a lot to prove, and you've got to catch up. Yeah, so not Baidu, not Apple. Maybe Alibaba <laughs> kicks some of the boxes you mentioned. A cloud business, so it's getting with, yeah. uh, with, with Moonshot AI, of course, and that big investment they made there. Uh, does that look like a profile of a company that might... I think the, well. the long-run leaders in China AI are Tencent and Alibaba and Huawei, but obviously that's a private company because mm -hmm. scale ultimately wins out. Mm -hmm. And on a global basis, really quickly, if I can explain it, Go ahead. why invest in the AI companies themselves? You know, it's quite hard to pick their long-term winners and losers. Why not invest in the companies that are providing the picks and shovels and wheelbarrows that all these companies will use regardless of their long-term success? And those pick and shovel and wheelbarrow makers are the likes of Arm Holdings, who licenses to everyone, including NVIDIA, AMD, you name Mm. and TSMC who makes the chips on behalf of all these companies. So even if AMD or NVIDIA doesn't achieve long-term success, well, I'm not taking a view there, right. but theoretically if that were possible and others won, uh, Arm Holdings and TSMC will still be getting that business. So therefore, there's some risk diversification there if you want to see. So I, I, I think, you know, they're well-placed. All right, Robert Luke, great, Robert Lee, great stuff. Mm. Uh, we, we covered everything on all things AI here today. Yeah. I wasn't <laughs> expecting that. Yeah. yeah, but I think with the, uh, the Apple story, yeah, certainly I, I was thrown off by what German was going to say 
about this. I thought everyone was like, finally, right? Mm -hmm. We're going to see Apple really come come into the play when it comes to the AI space. Robert Lee, thank you, our senior analyst for Bloomberg Intelligence here. Uh, oh, yeah, so some breaking news. Well, not confirmed. Here we go. But local news, and this usually happens just a few minutes before that budget speech from Paul Chen, the financial secretary. So Singtao reporting that Hong Kong is to cancel some stamp duties for home buyers. So certainly that could help, maybe in terms of reviving this, this property market. You're seeing uh, not a whole lot of movement, but at least Sung Hong Kai has been paring back some of the initial losses. New World Development continues to be the outperformer amongst that group there. We're up about 2% for New World. Uh, they're also looking at perhaps raising the tobacco tax mm. even further. Yep, making the glorious but unhealthy habit, as some people would say, <laughs> a bit more expensive. Not just taxing your health, taxing your wallet too. There you go. All right. Just ahead, uh, we'll be looking at, so hopefully getting a pulse check of the luxury spending segment in mainland China. Harrods joins us as, well, it celebrates its latest private members club in Shanghai. Michael Ward, MD, joins us to talk us through that. This is Bloomberg.